The Gospel reading is from John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. (coughs) Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly in what they have done and what has been done in the sight of God. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now a prayer for a present for Pastor Pastor Terry. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful that Terry and her church leaders heard your call to serve and answered yes. We thank you Pastor Terry, and all of our church leaders who spread the good news of your love. Lord, we ask you to provide Terry with the time for her body and spirit to heal and bring her back to us healthy and refreshed. Father, we join many in commending our church leaders to you as we echo your words. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Amen. Good morning. Today's scripture from John chapter 3 contains some of the most widely known words of the Bible. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, so that anyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16, of course. It's easy to remember these words as we go about our lives if we've heard them enough. But as with so much in life, context is really important. It's important to understand the whole passage from John chapter 3, verse 14 through verse 21. It starts with, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, wait, what does that mean? The reference to Moses in the wilderness is found in Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 and 9, which was the other passage that Linda read today. Moses was leading the Israelites through the wilderness after leaving the tyranny of the Pharaoh in Egypt. You may recall that they were in Egypt for 400 years. Generations grew up only knowing tyranny. As you might imagine, the journey through the wilderness was difficult. And perhaps it's not surprising that the Israelites became discouraged and disenchanted. They soon forgot the reason for leaving Egypt in the first place. And some even longed to be living as they had under tyranny. Instead of celebrating their freedom, they became focused on the harsh reality of the daily life in the desert. I can't say I'd act any better because I am not a traveler. When the people complained about the detestable food and the lack of water, they asked Moses, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? They soon found out, though, that what they thought was a terrible life could be made much worse. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, 
They bit the people and many Israelites died. Now, I have a really hard time understanding why God would send snakes. This was his chosen people and he had just brought them out of tyranny. I had to think a lot about this when I was preparing. An idea that I came across and I do find compelling relates to the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night that accompanied the Israelites on their journey through the wilderness. Do you remember the Exodus story? These pillars represented God's protection over his people as they went. So imagine, rather than God physically sending snakes, maybe the snakes were always there. That region of the world is known to have a lot of poisonous snakes. But maybe the people weren't bitten by the serpents at the beginning of their wilderness journey because they were being protected by God. When the people were willing to acknowledge their relationship with God and live in proper alignment with him, they, understand how to, they understood how to live so that they would not be bitten by the snakes. But as the people forgot and distrusted their relationship with God, perhaps they lost their ability to discern the proper way to live. They were no longer protected by God, but not because God did not want to protect them, simply because they didn't have faith in God. They had sinned against God. They simply missed the mark. When they realized the error of their ways, they appealed to Moses to go to God on their behalf, and Moses prayed to God for the people. God responded with the directions, make a poisonous snake and set it on a pole, and everyone who's bitten shall look at it and live. Moses made the bronze serpent and put it on the pole as he was directed, and everyone who looked at it looked up and were in true repentance and were saved. Many people were thus saved, but many other people who were unwilling or unable to look up at the serpent died. The serpent is both real and symbolic at the same time, as often happens in the biblical text, the very thing that might bring about your demise if you don't have faith in God will save you if you live in accordance with God's commands. So back to the book of John, chapter 3. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus was raised upon the cross for everyone to see. But I have a feeling not everyone was willing to look up at him as he was crucified. To look upon Jesus and understand that each of us would be culpable in his death would be hard to bear. The sin of our actions and inactions might easily be too much to bear. The result of not looking at the bronze serpent was that those bitten by poisonous snakes died. Does the same follow if we do not look at, the G at Jesus raised on the cross? Who is willing to accept all that is required to repent and gaze upon our crucified Savior? Which is perhaps why John 3.17 was written. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. For those who believe in him are saved, and those who do not believe in him are condemned already. We are a fickle people, often forgetting the important things in life, just as the Israelites did in the wilderness. We indulge in short-term pleasures and gains, and in doing so, we live in shadows. Worse yet, we have the potential to cast shadows ourselves because we place ourselves between the light that has come into the world and those who need it so desperately. This could be the end of the story. But it's not, because in John 3.21, it states, but those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Through Jesus, we have a chance to repent and earnestly try again when we miss the mark. Remember, that's what sin means, to miss the mark. This constant opportunity for repentance and redirection towards God makes me think of something called ecological memory. 
You may know that I'm a landscape architect by trade. I focus a lot of my work on trees and forest ecology. I also happen to find great inspiration in nature. So take a walk with me in your mind into a beautiful forest on a summer day. The climax forest around us has de developed layers of growth, tall canopy trees that send dappled shadows across the forest floor, smaller, more beautiful flowering understory trees burst into bloom at the edge of the forest. The shrubs covered in berries that feed forest animals and birds line the edge of the, tree, the smaller trees. And the meadows of butterflies and bees and other pollinators spread far beyond the forest boundary. Imagine that suddenly a great fire breaks out. It destroys the fabric of that forest. The large trees burn into heaps of blackened stumps. The once shaded forest floor is now exposed to brilliant sunlight. The animals have scurried to find shelter elsewhere. It looks like there's nothing worth anything left. But ecological memory is what allows a landscape to reestablish after disaster has occurred. Given sun, water, and time, the forest will flourish again, starting with the tiniest green shoots that beckon animals to return. The regeneration of plants starts a journey back to ecological stability. The key to it all is what's found on the forest floor, deep in the soil. Did you know that there can be upwards of 100 million microbes in a single teaspoonful of soil? These critical organisms break down all that carbon to recycle the charred remnants of the once mighty forest into energy for future growth. And what about all those plants that come later in the regeneration of that forest? They primarily come from seeds deposited many years before that require the newly falling sun and rain to sprout in soil rich in microbes. This is resiliency, the ability of the forest to thrive in adverse conditions. As it goes about its daily lives, the forest deposits often unseen seeds that in the years to come will provide new life new opportunities, a new forest when the conditions are right. That's what ecological memory is all about. As we go about our daily lives, we can do the same thing. We're living today and preparing for tomorrow at the same time, based on how we've lived in the past. As we develop a relationship with God over time, seeds of that relationship are being deposited around us. We're building a spiritual memory. Inevitably, when life knocks us around a bit, it sometimes becomes a complete disaster. We can easily forget and put aside our relationship with God. We get distracted, lose touch, and become preoccupied with ourselves or our secular ambitions. We lose hope, become disgruntled, and complain that life is just too much to bear. But like the seeds in the soil on the forest floor, we have something that can restore the chaos in daily life. We should remember the snakes in the wilderness. Whether sent by God or simply unleashed by the inability of the Israelites to focus on being God's chosen people, it doesn't really matter. God provided an answer by way of Moses creating a bronze serpent and placing it on a pole to redirect their gaze and spirit of those people. Who looked, those who looked up at the serpent were saved from death. As we embark on this annual journey through Lent, we should remember that Jesus was sent for precisely the same purpose as the bronze serpent was created by Moses so long ago, to bring life to those who would believe in God. In the case of the bronze serpent, it was the earthly life that was saved from the effects of being bitten by poisonous snakes. In the case of Jesus, it's our eternal life that's saved, if only we will believe in him and live in accordance with what it means to be a child of God. As you move through Lent, may you find the strength to lift your gaze to the cross. May you find opportunity to reflect on the seeds of faith that may have been sowed in your past. 
May you earnestly strive to create the right conditions today that allow those seeds to germinate and flourish. May you move towards the light and not away from it. May you be inspired more frequently to recall John 3.16. For, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Thanks be to God. Please join me in reading a responsive reading that some of you will remember. It's called Seeds of Faith. Deep within each of us are nestled the seeds of faith, hope, joy, peace, and love gifted to us by our Creator. The seed of faith helps us to know the patterns of our days, of the seasons, of life and death, are unfolding as they're meant to do. Our journey will take us to incredible mountain peaks where we see the expansive world laid out before us, and our journey will take us through valleys dark with despair where we feel alone and afraid. The seed of faith, well nourished, will inspire us to seek brighter tomorrows than we can yet see. The seed of hope grows in the sunrise and the sunset, in the first blossoms of spring, in the first snowflakes of winter. It grows in the smile on a happy face and in the comfort of a warm embrace. Hope helps to keep our eyes lifted to the stars and the heavens when our feet need to rest for a while. The seed of joy comes in the birth of a child, the celebration of a friend, the new understanding that unfolds through discovery as we witness the amazing universe being revealed around us. Joy grows not in solitude, but as we share our lives with one another. We scatter joy as we weave our lives into our Creator's intricate fabric. The seed of peace emerges when we learn to reconcile what is with what has been and what could be. When we've taken what we were given, added the very best of who we are, and created a better place to start again. Peace is not passively waiting for water and sun, nor is it happenstance in its presence in our lives. Peace spreads its branches when we reach out to help others create brighter tomorrows. The seed of love is a tiny spark of the creator, quietly forming the loom and the threads that are the foundation of the fabric of our lives. Love is given and received without the thought of repayment. Love grows exponentially when we turn to the world around us and ask how we can help the seeds nestle deep within others to grow. May the seeds nestle deep within me, creator, grow strong and bear fruit that is worthy of all you have gifted to me. Amen. <laughs> 